So years ago, when I first got into the soil business, I would speak to loads of different people, different growers, farmers, managers, all of whom were concerned about their soil and generally had issues with the plant crops they were growing. And we would test their soil and the results would always be the same. Basically, their bacteria was all right or amazing, but the soil fungi was always lacking. And so we would send them off to do their homework. They'd maybe get a D, possibly a C plus, and we'd tell them they must try harder, which they duly did. Fair play to them. They would sit, plan things out, make changes, and try really hard to increase their soil fungi. And they would come back to us all excited so that we could test their soil again and the results were the same. Soil fungi was still in short supply and they tried lots of things, but were these things really different? Were they big enough changes? Now, we probably didn't help them that much because our kind of vocabulary was really consisting of telling them to apply fungal dominant compost as a solution and that was kind of it but actually fungal dominant compost isn't really commercially available so it was kind of a nothing solution but it took a little while for us before the penny really dropped and we realized what we were doing wrong or rather what we were not doing and we found that there were three principles which absolutely transformed their soil management and boosted their soil fungi through the roof. Now, what were these three changes that they needed to make? Well, we're gonna explore that today in this video, so let's get straight into it. So the first thing was to check that the soil conditions are right and good enough. Now I've talked about this before, especially recently in my video about boosting soil bacteria. And what I mean by this is checking that there is enough oxygen, checking that the water is regulated and controlled, so not too much, not too little, and making sure that there is the right foods available. And where foods are concerned, what we're talking about for fungi are those complex chains of carbon compounds, the types of food that you find scattered over the floor in a woodland. So we're aiming for a woodland floor type effect for our plants and crops. Now, great way to achieve this is to let the bits of leaf litter, twigs, old plants, wood chip, all of these things add to your soil on the surface as one of the foods for what you are growing. And the great thing about this type of system is it's pretty low maintenance, it's certainly low fuss, you just scatter it over the surface and away you go. Over time it gets integrated into the soil, works its way in and is broken down and turned into foods. Along the way, it can also help to retain a little bit of moisture so it protects the surface of the soil to stop everything evaporating away when it's super hot. It can also hold on to it in its structure as well and be drawn from also when water is in short supply. The other great thing as well is it's very structural. So as it wheels its way into the top fraction of your soil, it's adding porosity and structure. So there's more air spaces for your crops as well. But this type of system isn't necessary for everyone, unless you're already running no dig, where you're used to the surface of your soil looking a little bit different to the classic kind of perfectly manicured billiard table, then you might have problems kind of smashing through that wall and coming over to this way of thinking. It isn't necessarily the most tidy way of growing crops, but it is effective and it is very natural. And I think it probably would help you if you do struggle to kind of make that transition from 
really nicely manicured soil to slightly scruffy or more natural, you should be proud of that change to a more natural type of soil environment, one that more closely resembles a forest floor. So woodland floor is the way to go to help ensure that the conditions are right. Now the next great way to boost numbers of fungi in the soil is to add some. Now what I mean by this is add more species as well as concentration. So boost the biodiversity that you have at your disposal working for you. And a way to do this, well there's a multiple ways to do this, the two main ones are to add a fungal product. And there's quite a few that are commercially available. They're great because they're easy to use. Generally, they kind of come in a powder that you mix with water or other materials and apply to your soil. The downside is they're often quite limited in terms of the species that they contain. So they tend to kind of center around the same six to a dozen types of species. So not necessarily the most uh, diverse overall, but highly effective. The other way, of course, to get fungi into your soil is to add your own inoculum. And this could quite simply be a case of taking a small portion of soil from a nearby woodland or ancient woodland, uh, with the owner's permission, of course, and you can apply this directly to your soil and all the fungal organisms that it contains will start to propagate through your soil. Or you could mix it with some rainwater and spread through the soil using your watering can with the rose on the end. And that's a great way to make it go further as well. Or you could make some other kind of amendment or inoculant from it. Now, if you think that is the type of thing you're interested in and would like to learn how to do, do let me know in the comments below. I am fully up for doing a video on making fungal inoculants, so just let me know. Inoculants are fantastic for not only adding numbers and adding activity to the soil, but they can add different species as well. But it's really quite important when adding species to the soil to make sure that they are adapted for the soil type and climate that you are in. And that's one of the big issues as well with a lot of the commercial product. If they're made in another country and imported, often the climatic conditions to which they're used to, the temperatures could be very different to those which ultimately they're gonna be used in. And in that way, the effects, the benefits of them will possibly be short lived. So do your research first, try and get as many different species as you can into the soil. And specifically, we're looking for endophytes. So those are the organic matter munching types of fungi that will eat up those carbon compounds and convert organic matter into fresh food for our plants. There are other sorts of fungi out there, such as mycorrhizal fungi, that works a little bit differently and perhaps we'll do a video on that another time. One last thing on adding fungal spores and fungal numbers and diversity to your soil. Uh, compost tea is possibly worth a look at as well. There are teas, extracts, all kinds of kind of liquid versions of this. If you're interested in exploring that further, then check out one of the other videos I've made as well. I'll leave a link below, which introduces the principles of compost tea. Now my third and final principle for you to adopt to drive up your soil fungi is all about crop rotation and planning your cropping. Now this should be a principle if you're serious about growing your own food that you're already adopting and you tend to plan ahead thinking about seasonal changes and what you would like to harvest and eat when. What I'm talking about here is extending that kind of um, thought process to include the soil environment as well. Now there are seasonal changes in the soil throughout the year. I've done another video on that which I'll leave a link to below. Temperature, humidity, moisture levels affect what's happening in the soil. 
but what you are growing massively influences this as well. So if you're looking to build soil fungi, you need to consider the very plants that you are growing. And brassicas are a prime example of a type of plant or crop which can inhibit fungal development. So if you grow lots of cabbages, this could set back your soil fungi numbers. So the antidote to that is whenever you're growing something which could negatively impact soil fungi, look to make up for it as quickly as you can. So after your cabbages come out, you want to be planting with another crop which either has no impact or possibly a positive impact to drive up those fungal numbers as quickly as possible. So all the time, you will be affecting the population, the ratio of bacteria to fungi. You want to be returning, if you can, to that equal point where you've got an equal amount of bacteria, an equal amount of fungi. So plan ahead, think about what you're growing and how that could possibly impact soil fungi and then ways that you could make up for it. An example of mitigating for negative impacts to soil fungi could be intercropping. Now years ago this was adopted by many as a way to manage pests. You could grow a companion crop, something like a marigold next to tomato in a greenhouse is a classic example. You could grow another plant which would either complement or have uh, a beneficial effect for the main cash crop that you are growing. You could think in a similar way with your soil biomass with the organisms that you're growing underground as well. So if you're growing something which negatively impacts fungi, maybe grow something immediately next to it that positively impacts it. For example, a shrub or woody type plant with cabbages immediately next to it might lessen that impact or if you want to take it to the extreme, you can have an orchard with cabbages planted between all of the trees. You can have some real fun experimenting with this, seeing what works, what doesn't, and you could ultimately end up growing some plants in some really unusual and fun places. So plan ahead and think below ground as well as above ground in terms of the impacts that you are having. There we go, that wraps this video up. I hope you enjoyed it. Now, if you are ever going to do things to make changes in your soil, I would fully urge you to do a soil test at the start, get a baseline before you start to make changes. And in that way, if you measure it, you can manage it. So you can quantify and assess and truly understand the impacts, hopefully positive, of your actions. But similarly, if they don't work, you need to know about it so that you can try something else. Now, as I mentioned, uh, inoculants is a topic I haven't covered yet. And if you would like me to do a how-to on making certain inoculants, do let me know in the comments. I would love to hear from you. But we'll leave it there for now. And until the next video, I will see you soon.